Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsor of the GAA All Ireland Under 20 and Senior Hurling Championships. Hashtag Hurling to the Core. Hello and welcome to the Throwin Independent.ie's GAA podcast in association with Board Gosh Energy. I'm Will Sattery, delighted to be joined as always by Michael Verney. Michael, hello. How's it going, Will? Yeah, good, good. Uh, very exciting weekend of hurling action in Croke Park. Waterford Limerick, we are left with the rematch of the Munster final. Uh, what did you make of the weekend's action? Uh, yeah, two different types of games. Also, Saturday was just unbelievable stuff. Like Saturday was uh, another chapter added to this kind of mad 2020 season. Like Kilkenny losing a seven point lead and kind of been beaten fairly well at the end. And then this, like, just a tense. Uh, tense kind of an arm wrestle on Sunday in Crow Park between Limerick and Galway. And obviously just uh, with, with, with Joe Canning going off injured as well, just uh, hopefully he's okay. It looks like he suffered a concussion. Hopefully that's not the last time we see his uh, his genius in Crow Park because those four sideline cuts, it's, it's never been done in Championship Hurling before. Four sideline cuts, uh, absolutely out, outstanding stuff. So hopefully that's not the last we, last we see him in Crow Park or in a Galway jersey. But uh, yeah, uh, a brilliant a brilliant weekend. Sets up a uh, kind of a tantalizing kind of a final, too. Well, we're delighted to recap that great weekend of hurling with Ursa, Jacob, and John Milan. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Bye, and, John, what have the celebrations been like in Waterford over the last couple of days? An amazing comeback against Kilkenny, one of the best halves of hurling Waterford have probably ever produced. You know, what, what's it been like in the county, uh, you know, since then? Hey, well, I'll tell you, Will, it's just as well I'm not on Twitter or Facebook. Thank God I'm not because we. <laughs> <laughs> my phone was phone was upended with messages coming in Saturday uh, Saturday you know but I don't think I've uh, I don't think I, I, I thought I'd ever see uh, a, a second half performance um, that would overtake the Munster final one in 2004 but that second half performance Saturday night went went beyond it and, e- and even more it was just incredible um, I mean Half time, I mean Kilkenny at half time there was there were seven points up, but I always felt at half time. I said to the wife, we were we were we were nine points down, and I think Kilkenny had about two or three opportunities after that to kind of push it out. And she said, no, she said we said the, the, the game's gone. I said no, the game is not gone. I said if we don't concede a green flag, another another goal, I said we can push on and, and, and win this game. If we get into half time, uh. And you know, even six or seven points down, and luckily enough, we 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 got it we got it back to uh, to seven points, and then that third quarter, they were just unbelievable. And I looked the third quarter, Waterford in the previous games against Clare, Cork, Limerick, that third quarter, Waterford have been just unbelievable. Um, they've really taken over in, in in those games, and you know, you contrast that to Kilkenny. You know where they struggled in the third quarter against Dublin, uh, and you know again they struggled um, Saturday evening. And, and I just think, will I just think Kilkenny, the fact that they didn't go into the dressing room for uh, any of their three games, you know, there's a big difference between going in for a dressing room. It's a half time period. You're talking ten, fifteen minutes. You know, you can regroup, you can regather your thoughts. You're going to a warm dressing room. You can wing out rub down if you have to go to the toilet or whatever you have to do I think it's 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 massive and I think I think um, Kilkenny you know missed the trick by not going into the dressing room at half time um, over the course of the, 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 the last the last couple of weeks and now look probably that probably has to do with, 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 with our manager Brian Cody as well that you know he, he would be high risk but you know you look at Kilkenny over the years it was always that third quarter where they would come out and um, they just take over and blitz teams, you know that wasn't the case Saturday evening, and it probably wasn't the case in in the in the previous matches either. But I mean, Waterford, I mean, to a man, they were just they were just unbelievable. And, and look, can I can I just give a um, you know a special mention to to, uh, to 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 Jack Fagan? I mean, what an unbelievable story this is going to be if 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 if, if if he could become an All Ireland winner in, in, in two weeks' time, you know what that lad has gone through the last five years. You know, possibly should have been on the panel an awful lot earlier than, than he was this year. Um, but you know, he came alive, grabbed ball. I was never so delighted for Jack. 
Um, I see what he put, he's had to put it into it the, the last couple of years. Uh, you cut me the nicer chap, put it all on the line to come down from me. And um, possibly was playing under pressure the last couple of years to justify to try and get in on the panel at number one and then to probably justify why um, he was good enough to be on the panel. But let me tell you, um, he's going to be he's going to be the story of 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 of, of this this campaign if if we can push on and win the All Ireland. An incredible story, you know. It, it just goes to show you well, what a Christy Ring hurler or, or a Joe McDonough player can do when they put their mind to it. There, there's loads of players out there that are just as equally as good um, as Lee McCarthy players, and he was the one player the weekend where. You know, he's from your own club and look before representing rep, representees um, from De La Salle. But he was the one lad that I was never so proud of Saturday night because, you know, I, I've seen the journey he's had to come on the last four or five years uh, to, 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 uh, to try and break into the panel. And, you know, Cal has given him his, his opportunity. And uh, I think Waterford supporters, you know, I don't think Jack Fagan now has to worry about hurling under pressure anymore I think the Waterford supporters finally know that they, they, they have a, a really really good, really good player in, in, in their team Yeah one of the many interesting storylines from that Waterford team and nursery you were obviously in Croke Park on Saturday night you know what stood out to you in that third quarter when Waterford really got on top you know they went from I think seven points down to three up at the water break so they were actually pretty much in control of that second half by the time that water break came like what, what stood out to you? A few things that uh, stood out for me really was, I suppose, uh, for once, a team dominated Kilkenny in the air in the second half. So for me, the likes of Jack Fagan in particular, like he caught ball after ball after ball. And that led to Waterford's attack. Obviously, then you had Austin Gleeson, Stephen Bennett, even Jamie Barron. They were making surging runs through that Kilkenny defence, probably in the first half. Uh, Kilkenny's half back line and that were cutting out any space going into the full forward line. But I think... Crucially, in that third quarter, when Stephen Bennett went into the full forward line, I think he was lethal in there every time. And then on top of that, I think the couple of subs that um, that Watford made, Neil Montgomery got two super points, Dara Lyons came on, got a goal, like even Irla Daly at the end. So that's something that we're associating with the likes of Limerick in the last couple of years, the strength of the panel. I think Watford proved that on Saturday, those guys made the difference. And then you had Ty coming into the game, getting stronger and stronger as the game went on. And that just led to, you know, uh, what, like Kilkenny weren't able to cope with Water, Watford's intensity either because they were just running at numbers. The support play was phenomenal. And then the, the further the game went on, Watford grew in confidence and they just never looked back from that third quarter then. Yeah, Michael, and Ursula mentioned there, you know, the, the substitution to bring on Neil Montgomery when Liam Cahill did, it was so early in, in the game, you know, it was a real ruthless move by the manager, but things were going against him, you have to make those kind of decisions. Yeah, no, in fairness, uh, uh, John did a piece in The Independent on Saturday saying about how Liam Cattle was very Cody-esque and he definitely has that ruthless streak to him. Fairness to, to, to Jake Dillon, the energy he normally brings to the game, for whatever reason, he, ju- he just didn't have it on Saturday night. Um, I'm sure he'll be back in the equation for the All-Ireland final, but the Cattle probably realised that he needed someone like Neil Montgomery, who has probably only been just coming to probably 100% now. He had a, a hamstring injury, I think, coming into the into the Munster Championship. So he's kind of coming right now. There was absolutely no hesitation to to bring a guy like that in. And he added a lot of energy to it as well. Uh, got a couple of great scores too. Just the whole energy that Waterford were able to bring in that second half. Uh, as John says, like I think that was that was one of the great second half performances, not only by a Waterford team, but, but by any team. They just blew Kilkenny apart, apart physically and just their mobility and their speed. And, you know, that, that Conor Gleeson tackle in front of Liam Cattle uh, in the Hogan stand where... Cattle was, Cattle was giving it the big one and you could just see that was the intensity that they were after bringing to it and Kilkenny just couldn't match them in fairness and only for probably only for TJ Reid and John Donnelly at the far end it would have been a far bigger win and you know you're thinking if the game went on another 15 or 20 minutes like Waterford would have won pulling up because just a phenomenal second half performance and it's amazing they probably didn't believe going into the Munster final. This is my own opinion. I don't know if they believe going into the Munster final that they could actually win it against Limerick. I think they definitely believe going into the All-Ireland final that they can win it now, particularly after that the other night. 
Yeah, and I think I saw one statistic where the 217 they scored was one point more than what Kilkenny scored against them in the first half of the 2008 All-Ireland Final, which is, I suppose, held up as one of the all-time great uh, blitzes in a half. And, John, you're like, what is the mindset now going into this final? Obviously, Waterford played Limerick in the Munster Final, ran them pretty close. I think a lot of people were very impressed with that performance. You know, Liam Cahill spoke very confidently I thought after the semi-final on Saturday night he seems to believe the players seem to believe like how real is this possibility that Waterford could finally end that long dread for Liam McCarthy um, like like I, I think the reality is going to kick in that we can have, we, we are going to win it um, and I think look I think I'd echo what what Fernie said there I don't think that this, the full self-belief was there that they, they were good enough to uh, probably go toe-to-toe and, and, and get over the line against against Limerick. But I think I think within the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, that that's, that mindset has totally changed now. The self-belief is fully there. They're oozing in confidence. And they're really growing as, growing as a team. And, uh, you know, I think they've, they've the right man over them that, that, you know, fully believes that they are going to to uh, to 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 achieve um, the the success that we've been we've been yearning for, for since 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 1959. And I don't think there's going to be this thing that we'll look to just go up and have a have a crack of it. I think it was interesting to hear Stephen Bennett's comments during the week saying that you know Cal there was there was two trophies gone that you know we'll go and attack um, the other trophy and look it's 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 all about about winning winning trophies and. I think that, you know, after watching Limerick yesterday, I think they'll see a few chinks in the in, in Limerick's armour that, you know what, uh, we are well good enough to uh, to go and attack Limerick. I think they have all the ammunition to uh, to go and, and take Limerick on and and, and, and take Limerick down. Um, and I think it's 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 a it's a cracking opportunity for them. Mull, have you the, have you been on to Henry de Bramhead? Have you the horse ready to fly down Waterford Pier after the All Ireland? <laughs> Well, I say, I tell you now, Bernie, that was 2017. As I said in the radio yesterday, that's all in the past now, right? And and I think, I think, no, but but I think, but no, I honestly do. I think, I think we have to break away from all that. I think that was a bit of crack in 2017. I think you know we're going into this now that the mind is crack of horses and all that. I, I think the, the the wife at home told me she said it's either a horse or or, or our marriage. So I, I think that horse is going to possibly be a be an on runner, Bernie. Um, <laughs> so so uh, if 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 I want to hold on to my marriage and, and I want to see my kids go forward, I think the horse is an on runner. But I think you know we got we got we got to break away from all that. It's 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 not about me. I'm I, I'm past tense. My team is past tense. 2017 is past tense. All be it right. It, it was it was the foundation laid to to get us to where we are now and and to try and get us over get us over the line. But this is a new dawn. It's a new era. It's a new team under uh, under Liam Cal. And I think you know over the next two weeks, leave the players alone. It's going to be ideal for them. They're, you know, there's going to be no supporters going to their training sessions. They can go out, do their training. I think the ideal preparation is coming up that they don't have to be worrying about tickets. Don't have to be worrying about banquets. You know, don't have to be worrying about getting tickets for up for the match or, or the aftermath of our, our homecomings. This is just sole focus. Go up, jump in the car, straight to Crow Park. We're going to play in a hurling match. We've got to just give everything for 73, 74 minutes. Throw everything at it. 20, 20, man, 20 men, just go hammer and tongs at it. Empty yourself. And that's all we need to do. Is, is We need to go win a hurling match in two weeks' time. And look, I echo what, what John Coyley and Liam Callis says, I just hope there's a bit of common sense will prevail that the other 10 lads are able to sit up in the stand and be there and watch the match. But I think it's, it's, it's ideal for Waterford going into, the, going into this um, final in regards to preparation. It's going to be nice and low-key um, com- compared to the, to, the, to the previous two times in, in 2017 and, in, and, and 2008. And, and to be fair, in 2017, I think Derek and... Um, Derek and, and, and his management team, they handled it extremely well. They tried to keep it as low-key as, as possible. But I think with the right man over, over us, and I think with Liam Cal, right, the last time two Munster teams met in a Munster final and an All-Ireland final, Liam Cal par, par, partaked in it, uh, partook in it. And you go back to when, when, when he was successful with Cork and Tipperary, 
right? Under 20 success. They got beaten in the Munster final, got hammered. Came back in the All Ireland final, and against the odds, they beat, beat Cork. Last year, under 21, they won the Munster Championship, and then they pushed on and won the All Ireland. So, Liam Cattell has the experience of playing against, the, playing against a team and managing a team that he has had to, co- to come up against again in the All Ireland final. And I think that's going to stand Waterford in good stead going to this final as well. Yeah, it makes for an interesting dynamic and the dream still alive uh, for Waterford, Ursula, but for Kilkenny, it ends the semi-final stage. You know, where are this Kilkenny team now? Obviously still very reliant on players like TJ Reid, Richie Hogan had a little bit of a, of a renaissance this year. Still maybe waiting for some of the young players to take another step up to get into All-Ireland contention and to, to finally win another title. Where do you think they are now at the moment? Well, look, they'll be extremely disappointed after, you know, Saturday's defeat. And, you know, a lot of comments afterwards was, you know, if you can somehow manage to contain TJ's influence, you know, where's the other leaders? Where's the other guys? And I suppose, disappointingly enough this year, you know, even when Walter and Colin Fenley came in, you know, they didn't make any huge impact either. So you're kind of looking to the younger guys and, you know, there is some some guys like Owen Cody showed glimpses of it this year at stages. Uh, you know, you've John Donnelly, Mossy Keown, these are hard working guys, but you probably don't have the same caliber of guys coming through like the TJ Reeds or Richie Hogan's or, or Colin Benley. So look at Cody, you know, will be extremely disappointed to have let a lead like seven points slip, but he'll, you know, obviously the Leinster final was a big thing for them. You know, they, they were so thrilled after winning that and they'll have to go back to the drawing board and try to, you know, rebuild again and, and whatever. But it was very disappointing, you know, in those closing 10, 15 minutes of that game, you know, unless TJ was winning the ball, uh, you know, there was very other, you know, there was very little other guys maybe standing up and being counted. So that would be a worry for Kilkenny going forward. But, uh, you know, by far Watford were the, were the dominant team in that second half. Yeah, well, and Will, and, yeah. and, 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 and Will, it goes back to what I said two weeks ago, right? Look at TJ Reid. He was carrying the fight on his own, you know, probably looking for a little bit of help, looking around and saying, well, look, lads, come on, I need a bit of help. I need, you know, I can't be doing all this on my own. And it goes back to what I said. I think and all my time of watching Hurling since probably 1984, he's the greatest hurler I've seen in, 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 in the year I've seen the last 30 years. I don't care what he's done the last five, six years. has just been incredible. And you know, you know also, his longevity will, will, will end up proving that, that he's possibly the, 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 the best Kilkenny hurler of all time. Because I actually think, um, you know, he works in the gym, keeps himself in good nick. And I actually think Kilkenny will get another three or four years out of TJ Reid, they can throw him in on the edge of the square. I think in the next three or four years, he'll prove why he's the, be- the greatest Kilkenny horror of all time. He'll play till he's 34, 35 on the edge of the square, but he does need an awful lot more help. But I just thought, you know, in a Kilkenny team, the weekend, he was the one fella that kept the fight going, kept standing up, kept winning frees, kept laying off the ball, putting his hand up, grabbing ball, I thought he was unbelievable. And I just think, I haven't seen a player like him. Look, as I said, the debate will come a bit about bit himself and Henry. But for me, I just don't think I've, I've seen a player like him in the last 35, 36 years. I think he's just incredible. Yeah, and it looks like he'll probably win a, another All-Star this year, uh, if nothing else. Um, and Michael, maybe moving on to the other semi-final, Dan Limerick uh, outlast in Galway yesterday. It was a strange game that, like, despite the, besides the opening maybe 15 minutes, Limerick were, were pretty much on top, and yet we were level going into injury time with all, with all still to play for. Then Limerick kicked on once again. Do you think it was a, you know, a, a pretty a fair on the balance of play? Yeah, no, I do, yeah. It was uh, obviously a completely different type of game to Saturday night. I don't know... Uh, kind of look back on it again since I don't know was there a bit of uh, a bit of fear with Limerick um, that they would get caught at a semi-final stage again it wasn't um, there was a lot of aspects of it that the normal Limerick that we're used to seeing but there was a lot of things that we're not used to seeing David Reedy came in um, he, he probably had a chance to score in one three he didn't score I don't think he scored anything the Tom, Tom Morris he missed a handy enough chance from, from the left wing as well he was obviously outstanding outside of that but there were things happened that just normally don't happen with Limerick. And I just think even at the end, I just think they were willing the finish line to come. Whereas normally they would kind of go for your throat and keep the foot down on it. 
they kind of probably left Galway in the game. They should have, to me, they nearly should have been out of sight, to be honest with you. Um, and I, I just think they were very relieved after they're just they're back in a final. It would have been a disaster to been beaten in consecutive All Ireland semi finals. They're back in a final now. I'd expect massive improvement for them uh, in a final, and I think they will ha- they will get massive improvements. But I just think it was a matter of getting over the line for them. There ha- was nothing particularly flashy about it. But they, you know, they got the result that they wanted. They probably left Galway in the game an awful lot longer than than they should have been in the game. Seventy five minutes gone, the the games were level or the side was sides were level when Evan Island uh, drew Galway level. But that was probably to me it was more to do with uh, Limerick's inefficiency and some mistakes that they made. And I think they'll be, a lot of them will be eradicated for the next day. But they, they, at the end of the day, they they got what they came with. They got what they came for, I should say. Um, and I think they'd be just delighted to be in the final and expecting something completely different the next day. Yeah, so I guess Limerick sets such high standards for themselves that when they don't kind of obliterate teams or blow them away, people are kind of left kind of feeling that they maybe didn't put, produce their best performance. But as Michael said, there was a number of areas where they won't be happy. I think John Coyley alluded to them after the game. I suppose the performance of their wing forwards, Tom Morris and Gerard Hegarty, was one huge positive, probably contributed massively to getting them over the line. Yeah, without a doubt. And in particular in that first kind of quarter where Limerick maybe didn't settle that well, you know, Tom Morris, Tom Morrissey put his hand up and, you know, led the charge in the first half. And then Grode Hegarty was coming more and more into the game. So once again, the half forward line was the standout. You know, you, you got 12 points from Lynch, Hegarty and, and Morrissey again. So like that's going to be something that Watford no doubtedly are going to be, you know, focusing on in the next couple of weeks. And then for me as well, I suppose Dermot Burns and Kyle Hayes in the two halfbacks. In the first half, you know, Kyle Hayes, how many times did he push forward the soar and runs? He's such a physical player. Even in the second half, he, he managed to get up the field so far, he, he almost scored a goal. And Dermot Burns got, got two really brilliant uh, long-range uh, points as well. So for me, you know, obviously there's things for Limerick to work on, but... The, the big guys stood up again when they needed them. And again, that, that half hour line for me was the standout uh, for, from a Limerick perspective. That was yeah. after that was after the half hour line being quiet the last day and all the tension was on the full mm. forward line. And then the half hour is absolutely boom into it yesterday. Yeah, like they're just it just they offered the physicality they offer and the fact that I just thought it was really interesting. They knew they weren't gonna be able to hit the full forward line yesterday because Parik Mannion was back in front of them. So they can kind of play anyway. If they're playing 15 on 15, they can play ball in and Mulcati Mulcati and Galan, these lads will go to town. When they can't do that, they can still beat you from out the pitch. And as Ursula said there, like a huge tally like from the half hour line and then from Dermot Burns as well, and with Hayes driving forward. So they can kind of they'll beat you, they can beat you scoring points, but they can beat you scoring goals as well. And I think any narrative of you know Limerick not being able to get goals, they should have had probably two yesterday. Graham Mulcahy uh, inter- intercepted that Anna Murphy puck out in the first half. And I think nine times out of ten he controls it, brings it in and puts it in the back of the net. Same with even uh, one of uh, Seamus Flanagan's chances and even um even the the chance uh, that David Reedy had too. So I don't I don't buy that narrative that they, that they can't get goals or anything like that. They had the chances yesterday, but it just shows that they can beat you. They can beat you at points and beat you from out the field if they have to. Yeah, John. Like, what, what did you make of Liverpool's performance yesterday? I suppose with a view to the, to the rematch in a couple of weeks' time. As Michael said, the, like Waterford did a very good job on those wing forwards who were so destructive yesterday. You know, is that the key, the kind of key way to beating them in the final? Yeah, well, look, I think Verney touched on it there. You make some valid, valid points. If you're John Kiley, you're saying, right, we scored 27 points, right? We had another three or four good scoring opportunities, right? If 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 they bury one or two of them, all of a sudden, you now 27 points becomes 127, 227. And I mean, if they are scoring 127, 227, it's going to take a fair performance to, uh, to, to, to overcome them. And I suppose, look, what's been... You know, Kyle Hayes and and Dermot Burns, they, they were bombing forward. And look, I even go back to to Jack Fagan in the in the months of final when he was on Kyle Hayes. Albeit Kyle Hayes wasn't in the game, or Jack Fagan wasn't in the game, and and Hegarty wasn't in the game. Next thing, Jack Fagan got taken off in the 60th minute. Right? Who came into the game? Kyle Hayes and Garrod Hegarty. I think they could, they picked off about four or five points in that last quarter when Jack Fagan came off of. Uh, off of Kyle Hayes but that's the luxury they, they have as, as Verney touched on 
They can beat you anyway. They, they can beat you all over, all over the field. Half back line, midfield, half forward line, full forward line. It doesn't matter. And some of the scores that they picked off yesterday, you know, was just, it was just a joy to watch. But the one worry for Kylie going into the final is the concession of frees. I mean, he was giving out yesterday that I think the, the, the free count was 19, was it 18 frees to, to nine. And I think an awful lot of the frees I was up there yesterday were needless little frees. And I will, will, Kylie will, will uh, analyse last Sun- Sunday's game and they go through the, the video. He'll be showing the players, he'll be saying, well, look, there was four Limerick men around one Galway man and you still came in with a flick. There was no need to give away the free. Just stand them up. I thought there was an awful lot of silly frees that were given away. And I think that's going to be a major concern for, for Kylie going into the final. You know, when, when we've seen in the Munster final, we even seen it yesterday, when, when Galway, you know, took on the, the Limerick um, defence or midfield, you know, they came in high with the arm or, or high with the hurley uh, and gave away some needless frees. And if they continue to do that and they do that in the final, uh, you know, they're, 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 they, could be, they could be in trouble. I agree just on that as well. I think in the third quarter of the Munster final, Waterford decided to run at Limerick. Limerick's tackling is, you know, they're big, strong, physical men, but it's really, really borderline, particularly like, and I'm not a big fan of it, but I think Hurling is gone less and less contact now so if there's anything in any way dodgy like that you will win a free if you look back at the All-Ireland semi-final last year Kilkenny really went at Limerick in that first 10 or 15 minutes that opening quarter won a load of frees as well like TJ must have put over 4 or 5 in the first 10 minutes that day and Galway were kind of kept in it yesterday. When they, when Kincannon, when Whelan, when they ran at them, they got free. So I definitely think it's something Kylie's going to look to cut down on. It's definitely something that I think Liam Cattle and Mikey Beavins and the Waterford backroom team will be looking to try and make hay again. Like if they can get, you know, four or five cheap frees by, as, John, as Mull says there, there's, there's usually like four Limerick lads around. Like don't, they don't need to foul, but they're just maybe a little bit over aggressive. And even, your old Hegarty's um, hook in inverted commas or hook attempt out, out by the sideline, they have to be careful and he'll particularly have to be careful. He chops a lot. Um, he's very, uh, he's a bit over the top in some of his tackling as well. So I think that's something they need to be careful careful uh, of in the final or Watford will exploit it. Yeah, and Ursula, in terms of the Galway performance, you know, there'll, there'll be regret from them. I know, you know, their puck outs, you know, they, they probably didn't go as well as they had hoped. They, they gave away a lot of scores that way. Even though Joe Canning nails some unbelievable sideline balls, he didn't get a whole lot of opportunities in open play. You know, Whelan and Concanon looked very good on the ball when they got their opportunities, but again, probably didn't get the ball into them as much as they would have hoped. You know, how will they assess yesterday, uh, you know, after the defeat? <laughs> No doubt they're going to be extremely disappointed. And I suppose we can't underestimate the couple of losses that Galway had of players yesterday. You know, Cahal Mannion for me was a huge loss for them in the first half. You know, he's been one of their key players uh, in the last number of years. But to me, he was a massive, massive loss to that that Galway attack because he's a guy who's capable of scoring, you know, 60, 70 metres out from goal. So to me, you know, that was a, a really disappointing thing to see him go off the field. The same with Joe, you know, after getting four huge sidelines, you know, you don't want to see a player like of his calibre to go off the field. Um, you know, one positive, I suppose, for, for Galway, they'll say that, look, when Evan Nyland came on, you know, he, he in fairness, he scored his free incredibly and got a, a great point as well. Um, but I suppose the probably thing that was very disappointing that like Limerick kind of got on top of their forwards in the second half and really stifled any play going in. And then it meant that the likes of Con Cannon, Connor Whelan, even when Jason Flynn came in, they, they weren't really seeing much ball. So they weren't posing as much of a threat to the to the Limerick defence then and they didn't really you know uh, trouble Nicky Quaid in the goal either and, and that would have been a, a bit of a worry for them but you know they'll be extremely disappointed they probably fully believe that you know they could uh, come close to beating Limerick you know no doubt uh, you know and Shane, Shane O'Neill has done a, a very good job with Galway uh, and you know he did maybe unearth a couple of new players this year as well but uh, no doubt they're going to be extremely disappointed to lose because as you said they were going in level, you know, into injury time yesterday and maybe a couple of uh, decisions, maybe in the first half, maybe when Galway were on top, you know, maybe they should have pushed on a little bit more and, and that's maybe where they'll rue some of the regrets then. Do you yeah. think, that did they set up to win the game or did they set up to stay in the game? Yeah, I, I think there was a little bit of, of, of kind of trying to stay in the game rather than maybe actually going out and fully expressing themselves and actually really fully going at 
at Limerick and maybe they didn't expose mm -hmm. Limerick in, 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 the, in the best way either. And I think there was a little bit of that from both Limerick and Galway. Um, Limerick probably didn't fully go out either. It was like maybe, as you said, that there was the fear of losing. And I think Galway maybe had that attitude maybe subconsciously uh, in, in throughout that game yesterday because you know maybe they were afraid of making mistakes and that and that's a that's a thing that can be uh, if it seeps into a team that's not a good team whereas for me in contrast when you look at Watford Watford went out guns blazing in that second half and said look we don't want to have any regrets and by god they they showed that uh, so that that would be a disappointment factor for for Galway no doubt and John, we might give the last word on the weekend to you. So, it's two weeks' time, Waterford versus Limerick. Who do you think is going to do it? Oh, look, it's it's going to be a mill watering final, and I think we've the two best teams um, in the country, two best teams that played the best hurling in, 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 in over the course of the last six weeks in the final, and um, probably play something similar, similar styles. You know, both half back lines are very strong, strong in midfield. Um, good aerial winners in, in the half forward line uh, the players inside in the full forward line can, can hurt you both have two good goalkeepers um, both like to go long both like to, to both the ball out of the fence um, both teams are full of running full of energy um, high work ethic manic aggression it's going to be a meltwatering final and I think it's, it's I think it's it's really going to, it's going to be very, very close. I think uh, the gap is starting to close now compared to the months of final. Compared to the start of the championship, I would have gone on the record here and said that uh, Limerick would have been a, a, a penalty kick from um, winning the All-Ireland. I would have said maybe COVID-19 might come in the way of them if, if, if COVID-19 virus got into their camp. But let me tell you, I don't think they're a penalty kick. I think they might be a corner kick, a free kick from winning. But I think this is going to be very much maybe a 55-45 game in, 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 in Limerick's favour but I'm starting to fully believe in, in, in our lads that, that they can that they can do, do the business and I fully believe in that we've the right man over the team and I think I think you're going to see the the end of a, of a, of a massive famine in, in two weeks time and look unfortunately the, the, the celebrations might might have to be put on hold or there'll be probably some form of low key but I don't care I, I don't think any water for 40 in their care once Lee McCarty is coming back to Shoreside it'll be the greatest Christmas of all time I think Waterford are going to do it well it's yeah, to me and I, I, I actually I, you have really me goose pimples now <laughs> even listening to you <laughs> <laughs> well best of luck John over the next couple of weeks it's set up to be an absolute cracker thanks for joining us no matter that's good Okay, we'll turn our thoughts towards the Camogie semi-finals over the weekend, Ursula. Now uh, we have a Galway Kilkenny final once again. I suppose Galway were probably expected to be Tipperary Kilkenny. Cork was definitely the, the, the tighter game going into it, and you know Cork got off to such a good start, but Kilkenny showed real fight to come back into that game. Were you surprised with how it unfolded in the end? Um, I suppose, if being honest, going into these two semi-finals, I probably would have tipped Cork and Galway to reach the final. I just was a little bit unsure that Kilkenny maybe hadn't been tested in the group stages, but credit to Kilkenny. And it's something I have to say, I admire this Kilkenny team because this is go they're going into their fifth All-Ireland final. They've lost the last three finals and yet they're still fighting back this year under new management. They had a point to prove. They wanted to get the upper hand on Cork. And even though they started very slowly on Saturday, uh, they really finished the game strong and the two, go two goals proved crucial in the game. But um, I think they'll be really going all out now to try and make amends for last year's uh, defeat to Galway because they probably completely underperformed and Galway just blew them out of the water. So I think it's going to be a really uh, intriguing battle between the two teams. Yeah, Michael, and for Kilkenny, as Ursula said, you know, having lost three finals in a row, to come back, you know, again, and especially after going behind early against Cork, it shows great character. And while they will be underdogs in the final, you know, you, you can't, you know, not be impressed with the way they've battled back to another final. No, it's serious character. And obviously, I'm sure while Anne Downey was there, she was hoping and praying that they would eventually get back over the line again, having led them to, to one a couple of years ago as well. Brian Downing's after coming in, to, he kind of said after about them sticking to the game plan, and they definitely did, even though been been really, really hit early on. And you're kind of thinking... Jesus, Cork could kind of not pull away because it was always going to be a tight game, but you think maybe Cork could keep him at arm's length. But in, in fairness, 
they, st- they stuck to their game plan and got got their rewards after. Um, it was great to see even the pictures with uh, with Katie Power after just after the game, and she obviously has a, a knee injury, and she you know outside of and Dalton probably be you know one of their top players to see what yeah. they're doing even without her is is absolutely unreal. And just even on t- speaking of top players, and I'm sure Ursula would have come up against her a lot, like. Gemma O'Connor's recovery to play at the weekend is absolutely outstanding. I think it was a punctured lung four weeks ago, or so, was it? And in fairness, look at credit to Gemma. Like, she's a phenomenal player. She, you know, and maybe she's coming towards the end of her career. I'm not sure what decision she makes, but in fairness, her versatility, her skill level, her commitment to Cork over the last number of years, you, you can only admire it because she's been one of their leading players and she just showed her versatility on Saturday, you know, starting in full forward and obviously got that cracking goal. But, you know, for someone like her to come back, you know, recover from a punctured lung to go out and play a physical battle against Kilkenny, she should be applauded for that alone because that's just phenomenal. And it just shows her determination still at this stage after all that she's achieved and she's still willing to put her body on the line for the Cork cause. And unfortunately, they just came up on short, came up short. And in the other semi-final, Galway beating Tipperary after that kind of goal in the opening quarter, they were pretty much in control for, for the remainder of, of the game. Uh, you know, were you impressed with Galway? Were you expecting them to, to have that kind of comfortable, maybe comfortable might be too strong, but that kind of passage to the final? Yeah, uh, well, look, at I think Galway, for me, have been the most consistent, strongest team in this year's championship. You know, they've got the strength in their panel. They've got a few of the Sarsfields girls like the McGrath sisters back involved. So I think that's added to the, you know, the, the strength of their team. And, you know, defensively, they're very, very strong. You know, they really didn't allow much uh, play up in the in the tip attack and Sarah Darwin in fairness full back you know the leader the captain of the team she just led from from the back there and you know they'll be happy enough with the performance it was a gritty performance it was a good team performance and I think they just did enough I think they were you know they were probably expected that they were going to be Tipperary Tipperary were missing some really big names big players the injuries probably you know like they had Nicole Walsh Ashley Maloney who we were all mad to see play Kamogi was injured, Orlo Dwyer was in Australia. So Tip were always going to struggle against Galway if they were missing three or four key players. But for me, Galway got the job done and they'll be looking forward to the final against Kilkenny. And who do you see coming out on top there? Galway are obviously the favourites. And would you give Kilkenny any chance of arresting this kind of uh, losing record they have in recent years in the final? Well, without a doubt, I give Kilkenny every chance. I, I think it's going to be a really tight battle between the two teams. I think Brian Dowland has brought in a, a freshness to the setup, and it's something that probably Kilkenny needed, you know, because Anne Downey did phenomenal work, and no, no doubt about that. But for me, I think Galway have a point to prove. The last time they won the All Ireland in 2013, they w- wanted to kick on and, and, and uh, win back to back titles. They failed to do that. I think they they have a point to prove. They want to prove that they're a great team, not just a good team after winning one on our, one All Ireland. So I think for me, if I was saying, I think Galway are going to just edge it. I think uh, they've just got the strength in numbers. They've got more experienced players. Kilkenny are building again because, as as Michael said, they're missing some vital players. Katie Power is a huge loss for Kilkenny. So I just think Galway will will edge it in the final. It's a great kind of a final to have because you're just thinking, surely Kilkenny can't lose four years in a row and all the hardship and pain that that brings. But then Galway do have that pain of like, they they haven't done back to back in they haven't done back to back in a long long time. I'd say if if well mate, I'm sure they have if ever even I'm not sure. Sure, I don't think they have. So yeah, why I think you know Galway definitely are going to be going all guns blazing to 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 you know to actually make it back to back, but. Kilkenny, you know, if you're looking on the outside, God, you've seen the heartbreak that they've had in the last three years. And they're a phenomenal team. They're a really close-knit uh, bunch of girls. And I know a lot of them personally. And I know the stuff that they've put in behind the scenes to get back to where they are. But, you know, just because, you know, you've put in the effort and work doesn't mean you'll always, uh, you know, reap the rewards. But look, I think it's going to be a really, really intriguing battle. Uh, and I hope... It'll get the you know the coverage and everything that it deserves because obviously it's the night before the hurling final, so it, it hopefully it'll be a brilliant weekend of sport you know uh, on the twelfth and thirteenth of December. Yeah, it's a nice curtain raiser for what's yeah. going to be a great weekend of action. Ursula, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. Thank you.
And now we'll look ahead to the football semi-finals next weekend. But now first a reminder that Board Gosh Energy is getting inside the living rooms of the hurling's most passionate fans. Share your Gaga box moments using hashtag hurling to the core on Twitter to be in with a chance of winning unmissable rewards thanks to Board Gosh Energy. And John Milan's a- house and all Ireland final day, Will. Oh, That's where they need to go. How do you imagine? Yeah. What <laughs> the, the passion that that man brings to things is unbelievable. I, like even I suppose hopefully we get him on uh, regardless of the result. But if it's a positive one, God, uh, the emotion I'm sure he'll bring will be something else. But we might just finish up, Michael, by looking at the, the football semi-finals next weekend. Dublin Cavan and uh, Mayo Tipperary. Obviously, we have these unique uh, semi-finals after the, the two shocks in the provincials uh, two weeks ago. Dublin Cavan Saturday night. Dublin are one to one hundred. Obviously, that points one way. Like, if you're Cavan, how do you approach this game? Uh, I think they just have to approach it the way they've approached all these other games. Um, try and bring that kind of level of, of ravenous kind of work rate that they brought to the, the Ulster final in particular, and I suppose the level of uh, belief that they've built up over the last probably four games. Um, they just need to approach it the exact same. They need to pro- try and approach it the same way, but. At the end of the day, I suppose it's hard to approach it the same way when we have that cloud of it's Dublin that's coming now. And I you know I did a piece last week on uh, Mickey the Miracle Worker, you know, how he's pulled off these two big miracles, uh, in the two biggest, probably two of the biggest shocks in provincial final history. But this is a miracle of a different scale yeah. completely. You know, you're looking to try and bring down the six in a row chasing all Ireland champions. And, you know, as, as Shawnee Johnson said last week, they're not just the best team in the country, it's probably the best team of all time. And that's that's what, what you're up against. But they, they can't, I suppose you can't, uh, you can't get caught in a shell or, you know, go away from the things that have brought you to the dance. They need to try and keep doing what they've been doing. They need to have, you know, they need to have Ray Galligan coming up and kicking those long range frees. They need to try and have Thomas Galligan as impactful as he has been, Gerard McCurran and surging forward. They need to try and play to their strengths and I suppose maybe not get too infatuated with Dublin, but it's, I suppose it's hard not to when you know what they, they can do to you. I think the psychological thing is, you know, if they're hit with a couple of early blows, it's just that they're able to kind of bounce back and they're not, you know, crippled, uh, crippled by that as many other teams have been uh, probably most recently me. Like, they have to know that even if they can see a couple of uh, big scores earlier on that they're going to bounce back. But it is, it's a mammoth, mammoth task facing them realistically. Yeah, because Cavan, I think, have trailed in every championship game this year at halftime and come back. You kind of have the sense that if they're trailing at halftime against Dublin, it's a very, very small chance they'll probably be able to turn that around. So, I so the, the strong start, even getting to the first water break with the game in the balance, like every little victory you can get along the way will be massive for their self-belief. Yeah, I think the I think the water breaks are, are probably a negative in many ways. But for you know, when you're trying to split the game into segments, if they can just keep it tight for that first water break and keep in it. Uh, keep you know a score or two, score or two uh, in it, and then try probably push on and push on again until half time. Keep the game as competitive as they possibly can. It w- it would be it'd be really interesting, you know, if it was competitive after fifty or fifty five minutes, because they obviously have an unbelievable confidence down the stretch. They've performed unbelievably well in in the last quarter and over their four games, probably outside of maybe the Antrim game. So it's just yeah, it, it's it's difficult. They can't they can't like uh, adapt things too much to try and stay in the game either because yeah. they're not playing to their strengths when they do that. But yeah, the odds the odds are just. I was looking at the odds even just before before the show started. They are like Cavan are twenty to one outsiders, like in an All Ireland semi final, a Division Three side against a Division One side, but the Ulster champions against the Leinster champions. It does show you the scale of the task ahead. I think if they're able to be competitive, um, if they're able to be competitive, I think they'll be happy to some respect. Yeah, and from a Dublin perspective, you know, there was a lot of talk, obviously, this year, Jim Gavin's first year out of the job, Desi Farrell coming in, Jack McCaffrey stepping away. And while you, you couldn't say that they've been overly tested in terms of the teams they've played, you know, you know, Mead, Leash and West Mead, They've looked, they've looked as like pretty seamless to what they were last year. Even someone like Kieran Kilkenny has looked even better probably than he has previous. I think he's kicked 113 from play in the first three matches or something along those lines. So he's looking very, very sharp. Even having Paul Mannion kind of coming back off the bench last week, getting some game time under his leg with, with the tougher challenges to come. They look very well primed for another all yeah. Yeah, they haven't skipped the beat realistically, have they? Um, everything has just gone smooth sailing. And I think... From Desi Farrell's point of view, there's uh, there's a confidence that comes from that. There's also probably a small bit of nervousness that comes from that. I think he'd love, I think he'd love a big test ahead of an All Ireland final and a big test 
realistically could be even you know a really tight first half uh, where they're where they're asked some questions they haven't really been asked been asked any questions yet in this year's championship from um, from uh, a neutral's point of view kind of part of me is is thinking you know if they have a comprehensive semi final win perhaps it makes it. Uh, more likely that they could be caught in an All Ireland final if they haven't been tested, and this kind of unbelievable intensity maybe that a Mayo maybe would bring um, hasn't been put up to them yet. But they'll they'll just they'll just do what they have to do. They just they just seem to you know Jim Gavin had a, it was ad nauseum to, talking about the process when he was there. But that's the 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 pieces change and um, the pieces even and the personnel change on the sideline but what happens between the white lines doesn't seem to change at all and you see Brian Howard coming on the last day Karma Costello uh, who's obviously available for the game now and we weren't sure whether he would be and even Paul Mannion coming in as well they definitely have the the strength the strength and depth there as well and if it, they have the luxury of you know if one of these newcomers in particular isn't you know up to it or not playing in playing well in the semi final that they can bring in one of these you know guys guys that have a handful of all stars between them you know yeah and then the other semi final Mayo versus Tipperary Mayo favorites obviously but on paper it looks to be far closer and even when you consider that I suppose Mayo don't really have the experienced core that they would have had going up to Croke Park in, you know, most of their other appearances there over the last couple of years. You still have, you know, your Aidan O'Shea, Killian O'Connor, guys like that, David Clark in goals. But, you know, a very much a young cohort, especially in defence now with Keith Higgins, Colin Boyle, maybe transitioned out of the starting team. Tip will probably have as many survivors from that 2016 semi-final, if not, if not a few more. It seems that there could be maybe a possibility of an upset there. Yeah, no, there definitely is a possibility. Um, I think probably when you look at what's what's one of Tip's strongest line, you'd probably say the full forward line and you'd be looking at Connor Sweeney and probably Michael uh, Quinlevin and then you're thinking Ushi Mullen has been brilliant coming in but this is probably a new test and it's a new test in Crow Park as well um, and while you know a good few of these Mayo guys would have played that under 20 All-Ireland in recent years in Crow Park they probably haven't played a big senior championship match in Crow Park so there's, they have some probably questions to answer, even the likes of Oshie Mullen, Owen McLaughlin, uh, these kind of guys, new faces coming in, playing big games. They'll definitely be, like, it's a nice position for Tip to be coming in again. It's probably sim- something similar to the to the Munster final, but there's probably a lot more solidity uh, in the side that they're playing as opposed to maybe the, the Cork side that they played in the Munster final. But they'll definitely fancy their chances. They have Colin O'Reardon available again. I think they have a clean bill of health again. Uh, they're obviously coming in huge confidence. They've uh, the majority of those guys would have played uh, an All Ireland minor, minor final there in eleven when they beat you know uh, a star so the dub side. They were obviously in an All Ireland semi final four years ago. A good few of them would have played in an All Ireland under twenty one final in twenty fifteen as well. So they definitely bring an awful lot of confidence, and they will be probably seeing it as everybody is building it and. I, I'm guilty for it as well. Everyone is building it as another Dublin Mayo All Ireland final. And this is our chance to rip up the script once again. We've done it already, and there's no reason why we can do it again. And even Tip's kind of chart through this year is kind of uh, a bit, it's been a mad kind of a season for them. They obviously beat, they obviously beat Claire, Connor Sweeney sidelined to force extra time against Limerick. Brian Fox got the winner then extra time. Then they beat Cork. This is just another. Another chance for them to do something pretty special. And as I said, a lot of these guys have a lot of success behind them. So they definitely won't be fearing Mayo. And I think they'll take a right good cut off them. And it's probably going to be uh, an awful lot tighter than the odds would suggest, I'd say. Yeah, well, I thought on paper it doesn't look like next weekend's semi-finals will be quite as exciting as the hurling ones. But 2020 has been a strange year. You know, the provincial finals, we didn't think that would happen either. So Paper has been ripped up a lot of times already. With, so it could be ripped up again this weekend, you know. No, exactly. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where we're at next Monday. But for the moment, Michael, thanks so much for joining me. Cheers, Brett. And that's all we have time for this week on the Throne in association with Board Gosh Energy. We will be back next week with another podcast reviewing all the football action. And in the meantime, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or listen on independent.ie. So until next week, thanks for listening and goodbye.